Hello, everyone. Welcome to Nimwa Exchange. We'll get started in about 30 seconds. We're thrilled you're joining us today. My name is Addie, and uh, we'll get started shortly. Um, in the meantime, if you'd like, feel free to add your name and location in the chat just so we can get a sense who we're chatting with today. Hello, hello, as you're joining us. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for introducing yourself in the chat, letting us know where you're calling in from. I'm calling in from my apartment in DC. <clears throat> and we'll get started. Um, welcome to Nimwa Exchange. Look out, Ms. Shala, we're really excited to be here today. Hi, my name is Addie Gayoso. I'm Nimwa's senior educator. Welcome to Nimwa Exchange, a spinoff of the award-winning pandemic live stream series VMA Nimwa. I'm joined by my co-host, Jenny Trainer, Nimwa's associate editor. Hey, Jenny, thanks for joining us. Um, and hello, viewers. Um, thank you for being with us today. As always, we have enabled live transcription, which you can show or hide by clicking on the CC button in Zoom. Also, feel free to add your questions in the chat or in the Q&A. We'll keep an eye on those, and we'll do our best to address them today. So many of you might be familiar with our program, uh, but for those of you who might be joining us for the first time, each month, uh, Addie and I uh, and our colleagues at NIMWA host and are joined by special guests, um, usually women creatives. We want, to, we want to center women creatives in this program. And we consider topics that are relevant to our world and offer insight into different kinds of collaborations that we, the museum, is fostering while our building is closed for renovation, slated to reopen in the fall of 2023. So during this time of change, we're excited to exchange ideas with our guests and our viewers like you. Last month, we sat down with UK-based artist Michaela Chanchi, who was delightful to talk to. Um, and she recently collaborated with the museum shop on a product line inspired by our collection. To watch that episode with Michaela and other past episodes, you can check out our YouTube channel and you can subscribe to it to catch all future NIMWA Exchange episodes. And I think um, we'll plop that link in the chat at some point too. Awesome, thanks Jenny. Yeah, and um, today we are speaking with Michelle Love, AKA Sita Sadali, get that right. Um, who created our first artwork for NIMWA's Lookout Project series. Ms. Shalove's work, Reseated, A Forest Floor Low, can be seen on NIMWA's West Facade through July 31st, 2022. Ms. Shalove is a DC-based independent art director, muralist, designer, and illustrator. Her vibrant murals can be found throughout the DC area combining local and biographical storytelling with the tools and methods of graffiti and street art, Ms. Shalove explores themes including women's empowerment, nature, indigenous cultures, and music. We are also joined today by the museum's exhibition coordinator and the Lookout Project's managing curator, Hannah Shambroom, who will share some more about the challenges and triumphs of this exciting public art series. Thank you both so much, Sita and Hannah, for joining us today. We're glad you're here. Thanks, Addie. Yeah, sure. So Hannah, we'll start with you. I'd like to ask you if you could tell us a little bit more about the Lookout Project series. Um, when did planning for this first iteration begin and what excited you about Sita's participation? Sure, yeah. So um, really I would say planning for the project first began um, kind of like right when we first started planning for um, the renovation project, knowing that the museum would be closed for probably about, you know, two years or so. Um, and I think as you probably remember, everyone in every department was kind of brainstorming and thinking about ways that the museum could still have a presence and support our mission of championing women artists, even without a physical interior gallery space. Um, obviously that was a challenge, but 
Um, one idea that came up was activating the exterior of the building with a large scale public art project. Um, some people might be familiar with NIMWA's other public art project, the New York App Sculpture Project that places sculptures by women artists along the median in front of the museum on New York Avenue. Um, so we were kind of thinking about ways to transfer that idea of big publicly viewable and accessible artworks to the building's facade as a way to kind of counterbalance the construction going on inside. So that's sort of how this idea for Lookout was born. Um, the you know very first iteration, of course, is Miss Shalove's work, which is on the west facing facade right now. Um, and the project, I think, also has kind of allowed the museum to um, both continue championing women artists while also serving as a reminder to um, look out for the exciting changes that are happening on the inside of the building. Um, and then another component of it, too, was this exciting opportunity to showcase artists who um, are defying these sort of stereotypical or conventional expectations of the scale at which women artists work in. So really highlighting artists like Miss Shalove, who's working at a really large scale and whose work spans multiple stories across entire sides of buildings. Um, so that was sort of the general basis of the project. I think um, for Sita specifically, one of the first things that really drew us to her work is how engaged she is in local communities. Um, lots of people in the DC area may recognize some of her other works. She has murals throughout DC proper as well as in the larger DMV area. Um, and of course, you know, mural work is often site specific. So one thing that really drew us to her pieces was the way that she really considered the communities in which each piece um, is cited as well as the actual space and purpose of the building. So I remember one comment from one of our colleagues when we first um, began working with Sita is that her work depicts people who you feel like you know or who you feel like you want to know. Um, so it's, you know, it's so welcoming and I think fosters a real sense of connection and representation with viewers. And that was really exactly what we were aiming for with this project. So it was really a, a perfect match. Now, Sita, before we get into the specifics of um, this image in particular, can you just tell us a little bit about, um, you know, what people are always very interested to learn how artists became artists and, and kind of, you know, briefly, if you will, what your trajectory was and how you got to this point as an artist. Thank you um, and happy to be here. Um, wow. Well, <laughs> coming from a family of creatives, I think it was, you know, a lot was innate. Um, my upbringing was definitely an environment where um, creativity of all forms was was welcomed. Um, so, you know, I just, I went through basically um, uh, the graffiti scene in my early teens. Um, before that, of course, just the standard, um, you know, arts arts uh, interests. And then um, fell into uh, a freelance career doing fine art um, for a few years and then into uh, co-directing and co-owning a interactive and art um, boutique agency in Blagden Alley with my former partner, Arija Das, for about 13 years. And then I fell right into mural, mural making in 2011 and have been there pretty much ever since. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing a little bit more about your background. Um, yeah. I first, this is just a rendering we wanted to share. We'll share like a time lapse as well as some photos of the installation and final um, piece that you created for NIMWA, but um, it's really wonderful just to see sort of the process and we'll talk a little bit about that too. But first I just have to say, um, yeah, if you want to play that, Jenny, that would be awesome. It's a 14 second time lapse so you can get a sense of the installation. I just have to say, Sita, um, thank you so much for cloaking our building in such like, a beautiful and stunning way. And thanks to Hannah and the DC Commission for supporting this project. Um, we're, we often sort of joke internally about that, you know, there's this irony that our building was made by men, for men. It was designed to be a Masonic temple. It was designed by a male architect named Wadi Wood. But really since the seven or since the 80s, 1987, when the museum opened, the interior has really been about honoring and celebrating women artists. And I feel like we're at this moment of rebirth as an institution. And I sort of feel finally like the, our shell, the outside, really feels like it represents what's going on on the inside. So thank you so much for that. Um, your work, as it's called, uh, Reseated, A Forest 
explore flow um, is multi-layered in a lot of ways, conceptually and visually. And we're hoping you can tell us a little bit more about sort of how you came to this composition and sort of your thought process behind it. Sure, um, such great comments. Like I'm, I'm kind of taken aback at <laughs> how generous everyone's been with the piece and um, just how it's being received. And even the comment that your colleague uh, left you with, it's, it's really great feedback to hear. You know, as a someone that creates public art, mostly you create something in a space and there's, uh, you know, this wonderful exchange that happens with the weather, with the, you know, the community that's there, with um, everything that's happening in that space. Um, of course, that didn't happen here. So it's, it's interesting to hear these comments and just understand how the work is received once we artists leave the space and then it, you know, has a life of its own. Um, yeah, the piece, uh, you know, I was thinking about, um, you know, the title suggests th this thread. My mother, you know, I'm, I'm the youngest of a, um, a family of four kids uh, who were raised by a single mother who was from Java, Indonesia. She came here in the 60s to, um, as a Fulbright scholar. And so the art story began here. Um, she divorced my father when I was about one years old. So um, we didn't grow up knowing him, but we were raised by a Javanese woman in America without our Japanese family and without our, um, you know, our language, that's a huge, you know, uh, foundation of, of someone's identity. Um, however, we did grow up in the, you know, visiting the um, Indonesian embassy in DuPont Circle. So she was involved in so many cultural activities there, the Gamelan Orchestra and everything. This, this, um, uh, uh, ethnic, foundation was really solid with us, but still there was this yearning to connect. And I thought about how she must have felt, you know, leaving her, her family, not having anyone here to help raise us, but for anything else, cultural identity and, and um, exchanges outside of the embassy. So Reseated touches on this sort of me yearning to connect with that uh, lineage and, and my people. Um, but it also made me think about the pandemic and how we had also, you know, as a, as a world community, been through so much and had, had felt such separation in what we felt was normal. Um, and what does it mean to come out of that? So this is very much about sort of triumphing through what, you know, life has to present for us and, you know, how much our roots really provide such strength if we listen and if we dig and if we pay attention. So, um, you know, a little, about, a little bit about the piece. Uh, I wanted to definitely do a portrait, um, you know, psychological, psychologically people just really um, respond to seeing the human form and, and, and the face. So I wanted to present something that was based around portraiture. Um, this is a self-portrait, um, something I, I usually don't approach, but <laughs> I thought I'd try it this once. Um, so it's kind of interesting for me. It's, it's uh, I think cringy is a strong word, but you know, it's like when you're, when you present yourself or you're, you know, you're, you're on stage and someone tapes it and you watch it again, it's kind of like, Ooh, but, um, anyway, but it, I, I, I've gotten over that. Um, so here I am with, um, you know, a collection of Indonesian botanicals. They represent uh, my culture, my homeland, being of, you know, of the islands, being an ocean person. Um, you know, you, and I don't know if you can see this, but um, the wayang kulit, there are elements from these puppets. These are shadow puppets from Java, um, and they were ever present in the Gamlan uh, Orchestra in all of our time there at the embassy. You can still see this to these day, to this day, actually, by the way, um, at the embassy, they have, have tons of cultural programs. But, um, you know, just the intricacy of the work here is always inspiring to me. And I find that, you know, it's bled into my work and just the level of detail that I like to instill in, in a piece. So um, I've got different uh, elements of these Wayang Kulit, uh, you know, sort of framing the, um, the figure with some botanicals. Those are actually um, Indonesian um, magnolia, which have this really cool sort of sword-like appearance. Um, the jackfruit leaves is, you know, uh, you know, one of our staples for sustenance. Um, and, you know, you've got this, you know, I was thinking about my father and how he wasn't really a part of our lives, but 
the uh, the uh, it's an Australian um, eucalyptus that she's sort of looking to sort of hovering out of, out of frame um, so as a nod to my uh, my uh, uh, paternal heritage. Um, and yeah, I mean, there were, you know, as, as Hannah was mentioning, you know, site specific uh, considerations, the tree that's there, you know, how can we create, um, and especially, the, you know, the way the light comes through the fabric and the mesh and how that sort of plays with different times of day. You've got this platform um, for the construction workers, because this is an, an actual work site. So people have to utilize, you know, the scaffolding behind there. Um, how can we make that look uh, attractive but still be functional? How can the light be used to create different shapes and how interesting is that um, at different times of day? Um, and even with the, the movement of the wind, you know, what does that do to the piece? So a very interesting project, different substrate. Um, I've never worked on anything this large that was printed, um, especially on the mesh. And um, it, was a, it was a really interesting experience. Um, and the Nimwa team made it so smooth. I, I wanted to give a shout out to the, the workers that assembled this and, and hung the piece as well, because some of those photos, you know, just, you know, it, and, it's, and it's always true when you're looking at mural art, unless there's someone standing there, like the image on the right, you don't really understand the scale. So it's always really, really powerful to see the human form in juxtaposition with the piece. So if you haven't gotten down there, make sure you, uh, you check it out in person. Um, I definitely want to grab a coffee and just like hang out there in that park across the street for a while. <laughs> so what do you, what was it about Nimwa in particular that, that got you excited? I mean, um, you know, were you excited about working with Nimwa and what about this work is different from the way that maybe you usually work or, or some of your other works around the city? I mean, NIMLA is just such a fantastic institution, right? I mean, uh, in contrast, you know, I, in 2019, I believe, I attended a um, international women's hip hop conference and festival. And, and that was just, it was the first time I was at an event run by women for, well, by women and of women, um, all of the entertainers, all of the, the, the dancers, the, the hip hop acts, the, the painters, we were all women. And I just sat there looking around like, we are so powerful, you know? I mean, it, it's just, um, it's, I echo that same energy uh, working with uh, Nimwa and the great team there. And unfortunately we haven't been able to do any meetings in person or anything like that just because of COVID. But uh, I just think it's a really special, um, it's a special institution and one that needs to be celebrated and, and uh, 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 frequented and supported by all, regardless of um, sexual presentation. But um, definitely the different thing about this uh, project was just the fact that, you know, this is essentially a sketch. Like traditionally I'll create, I'll do the research, I'll create a, a sketch and a concept for a mural and then I'll go and render it. So I get to add my personality to the paint and the strokes. And um, I wasn't able to do that with this one. And that happens, you know, um, I come from a design background. There's plenty of design only projects, but that was that sort of missing step that I wasn't able to add to this piece. But I think, you know, the nature of it, the, the scale, the material, as I mentioned with the, the site specific elements of light, wind and, and uh, all of that, uh, was a great sort of counter counterbalance to that. Um, so, yeah. I'm just gonna jump ahead one to see what the next one is. Yeah, that just gives us a sense of what it, yeah. the final work looks like. And I think there's, you know, one of my biggest questions, and I think it, uh, a lot of folks who are listening today are really curious about the process, um, especially because this is somewhat different for you. You had talked, when we talked to you in our original conversation, Sita, you had mentioned that you had done like some some kind of like large like scrim for the Folk Life Festival, but this was this you mentioned is sort of the biggest kind of project like this you've done. And I'm curious to hear both from Hannah and from you about sort of the process from sort of the initial concept um, to the final installation, sort of 
what the process was. I know there are a lot of folks who you all worked together with to make this come to fruition, to make it a reality. So if you all wouldn't mind chatting a little bit more about the process, that would be great. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I can speak a little bit, I think, to the sort of like fabrication and construction side of things, but I don't know, Sita, if there was anything else you wanted to add about making the digital design or other considerations you had. I don't want to like step on your toes there. No, definitely. Did you want to go first? Uh, well, sure, sure. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I think from a more like logistical perspective, um, of course, you know, we started with Sita's amazing digital rendering. Um, and I would say overall, this was a highly collaborative effort from a lot of different teams. Um, you know, from the outset, this project, I think, as Adi mentioned, was funded by the DC Commission for Arts and Humanities through their Public Art Building Communities grant. So we were really grateful for their support there that helped us get this off the ground um, right from the beginning. Um, and then, you know, more, more physically with the process, I think once we had um, Sita's file, we were working simultaneously with a fabricator here in DC who printed this super large scale piece for us. And then also NIMWA's construction contracting team, um, Grunley, as well as scaffolding specialists who are giving all sorts of, um, I guess we could call it advice <laughs> um, and different, um, you know, restriction sort of of how something like this could be safely installed and connected. As you can see, we had a team like right up in the scaffolding. Um, but I guess kind of starting with the fabrication piece of it, um, we worked with CSI in DC and they printed this for us on um, three separate pieces. You can probably tell um, in some of the photos and in the time-lapse video. Um, so each piece was 16 feet across by 60 feet tall. Um, so they were really large. Um, they came, and CSI was amazing. They were like so conscious of getting the colors exactly right. And um, I know that they and CITAS kind of worked on the um, opacity together to make sure that everything would show up just as vibrantly as she intended in the digital rendering. Um, and they printed everything and wrapped it up and sent it to us. As you can see, you can see in the picture on the left, um, the team kind of just starting to unwrap one of the first pieces. I actually think they did unwrap it upside down first, but that was easily corrected. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can see like the scale of a person to something like this. Like they were just such huge pieces. Um, they started by installing that middle piece and then kind of worked their way um, on the sides to the edges um, and kind of made sure everything was connected. Um, it's like connected at all points through the scaffolding. The way that the scaffolding folks explained it to us is that basically we were trying to install a giant sail on the museum. So we had to be really, really careful to put grommets and connecting points throughout so that it didn't just blow, blow right over. Um, but I mean, honestly, just the, the, scaffolding team and Grunley, the construction crew were amazing in doing this. Um, I know Sita arrived kind of just as we were installing, I think either the second to last or last piece and got to see us connecting all of that together. Um, but she saw me like, you know, sort of a very type A, making sure everything was exactly lined up perfectly. And I was so concerned because there was like a little part of the fingers that wasn't lined up. and. Yeah, the scaffolding team just so patiently um, made sure everything was exactly lined up and they untied and retied the little bungees that connected, you know, like a dozen times over the course of a few days to make sure everything was exactly right. Um, and we were so appreciative of that because, you know, I think for them and their usual scope of work, the scaffolding has to just be covered in something, whether it's this beautiful artwork where it's just plain white scrim. Um, and we were really grateful that they really understood this as a work of art and took the care and attention to make it look as best as it could. Um, so yeah, it was really this huge, hugely collaborative, very teamwork based, and it could not have been done without every single person that was involved in it. So we're all very, very grateful for everyone's 
help and collaboration in that. <laughs> Thanks, Hannah, for shedding some light on a really complicated and complex process. And I know, Sita, we have, um, we'd love to, I think, hear a little bit more about the digital image that you start or that you created. I know that Lisa had some questions in the chat about how large the file was. Did it start as a photo collage? So we'd love to hear a little bit more about the original work of art. <laughs> Definitely. Um, how I typically work is I'll look for, especially if it's um, something that's based on the human form, I'll look for reference images that have um, a, a very visceral uh, effect on me. Like you'll just know it, like you're, you're flipping through options and um, it's just that it factor. Um, and I think I've, I've just honed that from all of my years working at, at my agency. It's just like... Um, being very image-based and reviewing so much content. Um, but yeah, essentially it's a photo collage. And um, the interesting thing with, with DPI or, or dot, dots per inch or resolution of an image is if you're printing something this large, you're never gonna see, like you're never gonna be standing right up close. So you're not gonna see the fact that, um, you know, it's, you know, a whole bunch of little blobs, essentially. So that's the one sort of forgiving thing about working with, um, you know, files and images and, you know, the whole roster versus vector thing and what's gonna um, scale well without any loss. Um, that's one thing we didn't have to worry about that much. Um, I believe for anything like the, um, the white strokes around the figure, I believe I did those in vector um, just to ensure that those were really crisp. But um, everything else is is based on um, you know original photos, um, so so yeah, it's just really assembling you know as you would any other um, digital image, uh, you know adjusting sizes of things and and checking and balancing um, and testing the sizes and the tones for everything just to make sure that um, that it flows well and that it feels balanced. One thing I like to do just in, from sort of a granular design perspective is when I'm creating a work, you know, are the colors balanced, you know, in maybe three points or, you know, across the piece. And then maybe there's a tone that just exists in one area and that's the highlight. So it's definitely this hierarchy of visual elements in that way. Um, and, and it's interesting for me also hearing about Hannah's uh, experience with production because I wasn't even involved in any of that after, you know, handing in the file. So there's a whole life beyond that. That was a, a, a lot of effort from a lot of different people. Um, one question I actually have for you, Hannah, is um, did the team that installed this have any knowledge about how to, because you were saying, you know, normally they're just putting up the scrim to protect the, uh, the street below from things falling down, but did the team ever uh, have the experience to ever uh, install something like this where it had to be like seen perfectly? Or did they get feedback from CSI or, or uh, any instructions on how to install it? Yeah, a little bit of both, I think. Um, they had asked us when we were having it delivered to have it be like extremely clearly labeled, like this is the middle piece, this is the left piece, et cetera. Like this is the top, this is the bottom. Um, so they definitely asked for exactly what they needed. Um, and then when we were out there, um, I, you know, I'm not exactly sure like if they had installed something that had an image on this like, like this before. I know, um, you know, lots of scaffolding in the DC area has some kind of imagery on it, whether it's a work of art like this or it's, um, you know, like on the sides of the stadiums and stuff like that, where they have like player spaces and stuff. Um, I know our fabricators said they do a lot of stuff like that. So it's certainly possible, but um, there was uh, one employee in particular, whose name was Dave, who is an artist himself, who was on the ground with me. He had his little walkie talkie. He was radioing the people up um, who were actually like on the scaffolding because they they also are doing it in all different places so um you can kind of see in this image through the um mesh you can see the different levels of the scaffolding and the platform so they had like multiple people on each level um you know kind of like fastening things as they went so he was radioing to each of them saying you know like this piece has to be a little higher this piece has to be a little lower um, and yeah, he, he had kind of shared with me that he was an artist himself and was really, uh, invested in making it look perfect. So yeah, a little bit of a mix of everything I would say. Shout out to Dave. Yeah, he was great. 
Great so, guy. He would, so he would really be like so and so on level three. Can you? Yeah. You know? Wow. <laughs> Yeah, they their system of communication was amazing. I have never seen anything like it, but yeah, they really, really got it done. So, so I'm just going to um, click ahead here and just so we can see some examples um, of other works by Michelove in DC. Um, you've had a very busy spring, I understand. And so Sita, if you if you just want to you know take us through the next few slides and and talk a little bit about each one. Sure. Uh, so uh, I just wrapped a project in Shaw, which is um, later on in the presentation. But um, this is one called Guardians of the Four Directions, which is not far from Nimwa's um, location. Um, <clears throat> it's in uh, Thomas Circle. Mm -hmm. um, and it was painted over maybe four weeks during um, the COVID pandemic, actually, when, when it started and then when the city shut down in the middle of March and then wrapped up um, um, just as the city was completely dead. So if you, if you go to the next slide, um, you can see a little bit about um, the, the location itself. If you're not from around here, or haven't been there yet, um, it's a very grand traffic circle. Um, that intersects, um, you know, 14th Mass. Um, what else is there? Vermont? Anyway. You, you can tell this is during, yeah. because look, there is yeah. I mean, look at that. no traffic. And, when is it ever yeah. like that? Yeah, and look all the way down um, Massachusetts. It's just like empty. So that, that was just a really intense experience. And there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of feedback from people that were just, you know, bewildered and they're taking walks in, at night and, you know, I heard this from several women that they felt unsafe, but then they would look up and see these women, these sort of guardians, and it would like allow them to stand taller and feel more protected, which is really um, endearing. Um, and just gave people something to see while life was really crazy. And they could just see this mural happening every day and building and building and building. Um, a little bit about, I mean, you'll spend four or five weeks in a four by eight foot basket um, which is an interesting experience, but uh, it's very freeing, but at the same time, very confining. So this is just a little bit uh, of a peek into the view um, out of the um, articulated boom lift. Um, the mural spans, I think, six floors high. So it's pretty high up. Um, and if you advance to the next slide, there's a little bit about, um, you know, it really does become your home. I've got food there, I've got music, I've got every supply I could need. There's rain gear, there's a rain fly in case it rains. Um, just so many tools are there um, because of course you wanna minimize the amount of time you have to go down to get something or go up to get something. Um, so uh, it, it's a pretty interesting <clears throat> a little little home that I have up there <laughs> and a, a shot from production. Um, a lot of that was painted with a, like a four inch brush. So it, you know, again, shout out to my Javanese roots and like the, the level of detail <laughs> I feel like I need to put into things. Even when you, you know, as I was saying, if you're standing back from a mural, you can't really see a lot of these details. So working in a sort of reduced way in a, a more generalized way with your lines and strokes is actually pretty successful, but um, yeah, interesting. Um, so the next slide, I believe, uh, this is the project I just completed in Shaw and it's called She Got We. Um, it was part of a um, DC commission uh, uh, grant that was awarded to Shaw Main Streets. And the, there's another piece on um, 9th Street at the gas station just before N, if you're going south, um, by Lisa Marie Thalhammer, uh, Nia Katura, and Maggie O'Neill. I, I believe those were the only three artists on that one, but it's, it's technically part of the same project. Um, if you want to advance down, you can see a little bit more detail. It basically features uh, portraits of, of six women, five women and one girl, um, folks that I know from the, the mostly DC area um, with some, some Baltimore in there as well. This image just lets you know about um, a little window into the, the scale of the piece. As I said, if, you're, if there's no reference in this picture on the right, like that could really be any size. It's, it's, it's interesting when you actually see a human being standing next to it. Um, uh, if you advance to the next one, there's a few more um, 
just you know from the project from production and um, again this, i just i just want to point out that look at the size of that brush <laughs> so oh i know i know i know well technically right here i'm adding a uh, a nose um piercing so it's the gold oh, okay. that goes in you there um, i'm sorry you didn't paint the whole thing with that tiny brush no no okay. <laughs> it's a very long project <laughs> Very long, but if you can um, flip flip back to um, slide thirteen um, up to, then I'll just um, wrap up this by explaining. This oh, sorry, one more down. There you go. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I was thinking about you know, okay, this is a women's uh, mural festival, and it's it should be something that's you know uh, geared towards women in some way, and you know, there's been a lot of you know, art that we've been seeing, a lot more art we've been seeing on the streets since, um, you know, the pandemic and, you know, the city shut down and, and really in general, seeing more murals around. And, and I just, I thought for this location, a collection of portraits would be the best approach. Um, and, and maybe as, the, as uh, I forget if Ginny or, ha or Hannah said this, but uh, like your colleague was saying, like, who, who are people that you would want to know or be inspired mm. by? And, and just, you know, how, how much murals can be a, a starting point for asking questions and finding out about histories and people and, and their stories. Um, so much too much to get into now, but each person in, in this piece has a, an interesting story and is very inspiring to women. So um, I was happy to, to produce this. It took five weeks. There was a lot of rain, there was mm -hmm. hail, there was so much wind, <laughs> but, uh, it got done, um, and uh, there's going to be a celebration June 4th to commemorate Great. the presentation of these two new pieces to the neighborhood. So, fantastic, amazing! Exciting. Congratulations! I, I'm just infinitely impressed by. I mean, you did this huge mural. Is it in five weeks? And do you have any help at all, Sita, or are you doing all of this yourself? I'm trying to get better. Sometimes you're not allowed to have more than, than one person in the lift because yeah. of uh, insurance issues. So that's when you know, okay, I got to do the whole thing. And I, I don't, you know, time just slips away as, as I'm sure most artists will report, but um, we had um, help with the, um, with the, the flat areas and even mm -hmm. just like having someone that when it's when it's cold sometimes just having someone there for moral support just totally helps, helps to boost <laughs> yeah, you up yeah. or you know someone to go you know grab the soup from the shop down the corner or something um and uh just to be your second pair of um not that you need it but just with moral support because it, it can get a little brutal out there you know um so yeah i've been working with people um more um and and it's always uh, a huge celebration when it ends because there's more people to celebrate with. So it's incredible. Congratulations. Thank I know you. it's also interesting to think about too, just all the variables that you are coping with working outside and the artists that were working indoors don't even probably comprehend. But we, during our uh, preliminary conversation, you were talking about the varnish, for instance, and how you were sort of unhappy with sort of how it made the colors look and it made me think a little bit too about what Hannah was saying about sort of making sure the vibrancy of your colors really leads in the final work of art and how important that is so I just think it's it's interesting to consider all of these um these variables including weather and wind and sun and rain and um things that you know traditional artists in a studio don't have to contend with at all so it's quite it's quite impressive just not in terms of the scale of your work, but also all of the, the struggles that you have to sort of work through to make it a reality. There's too many to list and, and you would be amazed at what happens out there. But, you know, I would say also on the flip side, there's so much beauty and, you know, the, the, the feedback from the elders in the community and just that makes it all worth it. Like each and every challenge and um, danger, actually, like it makes it all worth it to be honest. Um, if you want to go down to slide 16, there's, um, there's another project I'll, I'll dip into real quick. Um, this was completed. This is very unusual. I think this whole thing is about unusual uh, projects. You know, the, the NIMWA um, scrim was, was kind of a first thing. This one was definitely a first foray into what's called soffit um, decoration. Soffit is a ceiling. So this is in Union Market. Um, 
in Washington, DC. And you've got this new building, <clears throat> which is rectangular and on opposing corners of the building are um, two soffits. And this shows the two opposing corners. Um, the image on the right, those uh, soffits are a little longer, but essentially it was 397 individual two by four foot panels that, oh my gosh, it was, it was a lot to try to keep this um, uh, organized. Um, if you flip down one slide, you'll see, um, you might see some of these seams here, but we'll, we'll show some more um, detailed images of that so further on. Did you do this in situ or you were painting the panels elsewhere and then they were installed? Yeah, that's a big question. My neck would have been so jacked up. <laughs> if I was yeah. doing that you have right to do there. like Michelangelo and like lie on your back. Oh my God. Yeah, and then you're getting paint falling in your eyes. Like, oh, oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, like it's all. <laughs> wow, um, so yeah. How do, you, how do you do spray paint? So yeah, this was basically set up in different, what we were calling, it was different sections, but you could never see the entire composition at, at once. So I could mm -hmm. never see these entire um, oranges. And you've got these, uh, the shading around the entire sphere, but if you can't see where it stops, you don't know. Yeah. So it was a whole thing to try to get this to work, but we did it and it was a big it effort. Definitely um, works. It's amazing. Until you said that, I had no idea that they were individual panels. I thought dang. it was one. Well, it, it's interesting too, because uh, um, sight line, no, well, most people will never see the view you're seeing right now. And it's an amazing view. Like I was actually, uh, a fan of just lying down on the floor on the so in the terrace and just looking up because you're just immersed in this sea of color. Um, and unfortunately you don't get that impact from the ground, which is where most people will see it. But you can see the separations here a little bit between each mm -hmm. panel. Um, hadn't really happened, de definitely not around here. And the manufacturers, uh, are, um, Armstrong made these, these panels. The reps for Armstrong um, told me that no one, they hadn't seen anyone do that before. So it, which is fine, but from a professional's perspective where you have to, to ensure wear and uh, the longevity of the wear. And you know, I'm thinking about wind that's whipping around like the south edge of the building, which is something I've never had to think about. If the paint was peel, it was like dropped down or had a drip, just a few millimeters, the wind would catch that drip and go ahead and just peel it off of the panel, yeah. which is something we didn't account for. So it was, it was a, a big leap of faith in a lot of ways. Um, if, you, if you advance one more, um, you can see how we sort of broke down. That's part of the um, oh, the see. oranges, and and we had, and you can see behind me there are these. Um, I actually hired an architect who was amazing, who who designed these um, um, structures for us to hang with with these hooks, like all of these different panels. But we each each soffit was broken into what like six or seven different um, uh, sections. But then there were four different soffits. So in production, you have to keep everything separate. Everything's like labeled. And it was a, a giant puzzle, essentially. But wow. And how long sculpture. was this project? This project actually took three months. And I had a crew of three people working with me. Um, so yeah, it was, it was, if you advance one more slide, you can see. So we had two long rows of those uh, um, double-sided, sort of easels, if you will. Um, and mm -hmm. we had, uh, yeah, two of those. So we had four runs running at one time. And sometimes we mixed them up between the, the different ceilings, but this shows the full length on the top image. Um, and then, uh, yeah, it was, it was a feat. <laughs> it was a feat, but uh, very, very cool project. Uh, definitely a learning experience. Um, and, uh, and yeah, if you're if you're around there, like check it out. If you can get in the building, that's really cool. You should go up and lie lie down on the ground and just check it out. Oh, I just and go yeah. Back. yeah. Thank you for sharing these. I am just it's a feat in um I, I just think about you know creating work outside and I'm thinking about the idea of things that um you know permanence and ephemerality and all these consider these technical considerations that um, you're working through is really, um, it's, it's quite a feat and I'm impressed by it. We had a question just for clarification. Are the oranges prints, like the, the um, oranges we were looking at on that soffit or are they painted? My understanding is everything is painted here, right? Nothing is actually print. 
Everything is hand painted. Yeah, we used um, latex, acrylic, and spray enamel. Mm -hmm. um, the gold was a really cool thing to use, but of course, when you're varnishing, that will knock back your metallics. So that mm -hmm. was one thing that those metallics were actually a lot shinier than that. Mm -hmm. um, but we have to protect it. So we have no choice there. Also, the oxidation of a metallic happens uh, pretty easily. And if you're, you know, looking at longevity, you want to think about 10, hopefully 20 years and how is the material going to wear. Mm -hmm. um, so considerations like that were also folded in. Well, thank you so much, Sita, for sharing a little bit more about these projects. You've been extraordinarily busy <laughs> the last few years. I want to circle back to Hannah, just because I'm curious to if she can tease anything more about our upcoming Lookout series projects, and then we will wrap it up. And just as a reminder for everyone who's still with us, if you have any questions for Sita, um, feel free to put them in the chat, and uh, we'll try to get to them before the end. But Hannah, can you tell us a little bit more about what's next for Lookout? Sure. Yeah. So um, as I think you or maybe Sita mentioned earlier, um, Reseated will be on view at NIMWA through the end of July. Um, so through July 31st. So if you haven't yet, definitely head down to the museum site and check it out there. Um, and then we will have a second iteration of the project on view this fall. Um, I can't give away too many details just yet, but it will go up in the fall of this year and it'll actually shift over to the north facing facade of the museum. So this time it will be on view on that kind of like longer, wider um, side of the building that directly overlooks New York Ave um, kind of looking up towards Franklin Square Park. Um, so I know that's definitely a little bit of a tease, but um, if you follow along with our social media or our webpage or any of our um, e-newsletters, um, that's a great place to hear all of the most up-to-date info and learn more about that part of the project as we uh, begin to announce it. Awesome. Thanks, Hannah, for sharing and for being with us today. I, we do have a late-breaking question for Sita. Maybe she can answer this. John is wondering if you've ever worked with wraps, um, what they use for colorful cars instead of paint. Like, I'm thinking of, like, maybe things that they put on buses and things like that. I wonder if you've ever done that, Sita? No, I haven't yet. Um, but, you know, uh, it, the, the process... Um, is intriguing, especially because of the different viewing angles and it's a moving thing. So always, you know, always cool to think about that and, and ask yourself how, how those challenges can be um, can used to, to create something interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And Sita, if folks want to follow you um, on social, where, how should they find you? My website is woefully outdated. <laughs> So I would direct you to my Instagram, which is just M-I-S-S-C-H-E-L-O-V-E -E, um, on IG. Check out my stories. I love stories. Um, I, I, I know we probably ran out of time, but if you feel That's like okay. flipping through the, the end oh, of yeah, the let's go back. <laughs> as we talk, we don't have to talk about what's happening, but um, in, the, in the images, but um, I, I just love what happens when folks um, start begin to interact with the work, because mm -hmm. as I mentioned in the beginning, you're leaving this piece for the public. And you know, just to see what they do with that, it's kind of like call and response, right? Like I'm throwing out this image of these powerful women, and and this woman is like, you know, at her graduation, and she wants to, you know, have her parents drive her to Thomas Circle to get in her, you know, pose in her dress in front of these women. It just, it's so cool to see what folks, how folks create. I mean, her jacket is 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 matching, you know, the pink behind her, you know, which is probably a mistake or a happy accident, but. <laughs> You know how you know what are they doing? You know what are the poses that they, you know like this guy looks so cool in the in this in this garden next to my mural? Like who is he? Like what is, what is he gonna do with that photo? You know it's just I, I love it. It's it's um, the best part of doing this work, um, mm -hmm. just seeing how folks interact with it and how folks really bond and connect with and 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 have a strong emotional um, investment in it. And especially if they've seen it being painted, like they're mm -hmm. they're yeah, fiercely emotional about it, which I think is amazing. I think it's cool because your work really sort of pulls back a curtain and folks are able to see it in progress. And that's not something we normally see when we think about artwork that's hanging in our galleries. We don't, as viewers, ever have a chance to actually witness the making, which is really incredible. And it's also, it's accessible in ways that traditional artwork is not. So we wanna thank you so much for the incredible work that you do that has brightened DC. 
And I've added into the chat, um, the museum, Nimua has created a wonderful mural guide and Sita's uh, recorded um, talking a little bit more about some of the murals that are publicly accessible in DC. So you can access that whether you're local or not. Um, but we hope that you might be able to stop by and at least walk by Nimwa to see Sita's amazing work of art before the end of July. And I just want to thank you, you and Hannah, for being with us today, just as a way of wrapping up. Um, I just want to mention that um, our next episode of Nimwa Exchange is called Silver Lining, and it will be on Tuesday, June 14th at 12 Eastern, as always, and feel free to register. I'll put the link in the chat in just a second, but we'll be joined by the Assistant Curator of Decorative Arts at the Baltimore Museum of Art to learn more about NIMWA's long-term loan of silver objects to the BMA, as well as to learn more about the realities of women silversmiths in the late 18th and early 19th century in London. So switching gears a little bit, going, going back in time. Um, we do it all, we do it all. We're going back and forth. <laughs> but we wanna thank everyone so much for joining us. And again, Sita and Hannah, thank you for your time and for your work on this incredible project. Thanks to everyone who joined us today. Thank you guys. Thank you so much, yeah. Thanks everyone. Take care everyone, have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.